So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Marie forsberg mayer and the current chair of the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce here in Colorado, or SACO as we say. And we have 20 regional chambers with our umbrella organization SACUSA located in DC in the House of Sweden where also the Swedish embassy is residing. And our vision is to increase trade and commerce and investments between Sweden and Colorado. And this obviously aligns with the World Trade Center's mission. And there are many opportunities for us to collaborate to further increase the purpose and the value for our members and all stakeholders. So today, uh, World Trade Center and SACO are co-hosting this webinar and together with uh, Outdoor Industry Association. And on behalf of all our organizations, I would love to welcome all of you uh, to an hour full of insights of challenges and opportunities within this industry. Uh, but first, let me introduce Karen, Karen Gerwitz, uh, President and CEO of uh, World Trade Center, Denver. And I actually realized yesterday that you celebrate 10 years in this position this year. Yeah. So congratulations mm -hmm. to you. Thank but you. Actually, yeah. mainly congratulations to World Trade Center, Denver. <laughs> Thank you. So, and Karen is a visionary, a doer, and very passionate about trade, and international business and lifting the Rocky Mountain and Colorado business up to the level on in global arena. And um, she is a wealth of experience and knowledge that she brings into this field. And um, thank you, Karen, for what you do. And thank you for wanting to moderate the discussions today. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. And Rich Harper, uh, welcome. And thank you for partnering with us today. Uh, so Rich is the Director of Government, of Affa Government Affairs, I don't know if it's a hard thing for Swedes to say, <laughs> Government Affairs uh, for the Outdoor Industry Association, or OYA, as many of us say. And OYA is a leading voice uh, when it comes to the out outdoor industry and a force when it comes to the members are, um, to go into incre recreating um, and trade policy. And you do a lot, and you're going to talk a little bit more about that. And uh, I also want to warmly welcome our other two panelists, uh, CJ Riggins or Riggins. I never... Riggins, you're right. <laughs> Good. That's how a Swede would say. And uh, CJ, uh, you founded R Sports and the Athena athletic brand. Um, and it was born as, it is, as a result of your 20 years, 20 plus years of experience in the outdoor sports and apparel industry. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, you notice that there was a really a gap in the industry and the products were built for a very narrow segment of the population and the plus size female apparel um, that was completely under the, the population was underserved right so i'm look forward to hear more about that too great thanks and uh, dino dardano president at hestra usa and hestra i actually recognize as growing from growing up it is a glove brand that was um, started in Sweden. It was founded in Sweden in 1936. And I remember them as the really the, the professional ski racers were using the Hestra brand. Um, not until later, after moving here, I learned that it actually was more from the beginning, it was actually designed for woodsmen or lumberjacks, as you say. And Dino has managed Hestra here since 2005. And it's now a brand known for sports and fashion and work gloves also here in the US, not only in Sweden. Good afternoon. So, um, so before, before we dive into the discussions, that's why we're all here today. I was actually asked about uh, by my fellow partners today to share a little bit about how the outdoors is important for Swedes from a slightly different perspective. And a 2018 study uh, that showed that almost all Swedes are engaged in some kind of outdoor activity. And most of us are also active in the outdoors, in the nature. And we do take access to the outdoors for granted. And we have something that we call the public uh, or the right to, of public access or freedom to roam or the right to roam. Um, but I think the formal term is the right of public access. And it means that whether the public or the land is public or privately owned, we have access to it. And it exists in different forms in some other countries in the world too. But as far as I know, it's only Finland, Norway and Iceland that have a similar 
way of doing this. And the term has been around since 1940s, and it was written into the Swedish constitution in 1994, uh, but it's still not really a legislation per se, but it's been around since at least the thir 13th century. So it's inherited in common law. And uh, you can say that if I go into all the details, it would take another webinar, so let's not do that. But to briefly give you an idea of what it's about, it's the freedom to roam it means like it's freedom under responsibility. And the core, the rule of thumb is don't disturb and don't destroy. And things that are included in this right, to just give some examples, is that you can access any land, where, as long as it's not in someone's immediate vicinity. I mean, not my backyard or my house, but, or a land that is under cultivation. Um, but you can go swimming, you can biking, horseback riding, anywhere, unless you can cause very damage to something. Even private roads, um, an, an owner of a private road can ban motor vehicles, but not walkers, bikers, hikers. So, and then you can go boating, you can go swimming, you can go fishing um, around all the coast and the major five lakes, as long as like um, for private, not like netting and for commercial use. And one of the things I know a lot of people find interesting is you can put up a tent for one or two days oh. um, and you have the right to do that unless you disturb someone or destroy something. So it's all about respect for the nature, for the wildlife, for the landowners, and also for all the other people who want to have access to the nature. So we are maintaining this because we want those rights to continue, right? So um, before um, I moved here, I've, I would just say like when moving here in Colorado, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have all those rights. However, I would say that for a Swede, it's very easy to fall in love with Colorado and the lifestyle here and with outdoor right around the corner. So I don't think many Swedes will miss access to the outdoors while being here. And uh, so access to the outdoors and more outdoor activities also means that we need outdoor products, outdoor equipment, um, both here and in Sweden. So before we move into what we say, I was also mentioned a few Swedish brands and it would be interesting to know how many you know, know of them, but there are numerous Swedish brands that are present on the Swedish market from the outdoor industry. Uh, and one of them, besides Hestra, of course, is here today. Uh, one of them is Light My Fire, a uh, fire lighting kit and bio-based products for outdoor cooking and eating. Um, Tule, and for me, Tule is what I think is the racks on the car, top of the car, and you pack your ski gears and stuff up there and go to the mountains. Uh, Fjällräven, and I dare to say that most Swedish people uh, had some kind of a backpack with a little red fox on when they're growing up. And uh, craft sports and for performance sportswear, where, for example, the what they call it, the base layers for cold and hot weather, Hillebay, tents, of course, uh, Primus, where for backpacking and uh, backpacking stoves and campfire stones, and Silva. And Silva is interesting because that was actually the first, I didn't know that until I looked this up. It was the world's first liquid field compass. And it's also the world's first handheld GPS with an integrated digital, digital compass. So consumer interest and demand um, for outdoor activities and products have in general, I should say, increased now with COVID times. But um, there are a lot of stories around that. But how is the outdoor industry really doing? How has COVID impacted? And what other trade challenges and opportunities have the outdoor industry seen? So um, with that, and I will have a glass of water because obviously I forgot to drink that before I talked. Uh, so with that, I will leave for you, Karen, to lead the discussion uh, around this. Thank you, Marie. It's just so lovely to partner with you. And I'm jealous of your um, right to roam uh, because I think it's actually uh, just shows your um, shows the importance that the Swedes put on outdoor industry 
and um, certainly Colorado has um, we're, we're probably at the top of the top of the states in terms of recognizing and appreciating outdoor uh, the outdoor industry but it's um, it's certainly something that we can strive for is more more access and more um, public awareness um, that the Swedes bring to it. So thank you so much for partnering with us on this event. And I'd like to also thank the Outdoor Industry Association for your partnership. Um, I am just so honored to be here with this great panel today, and we're going to have a great, lively, interactive discussion. There will also be an opportunity to, to chat your Q&A into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. I'll be checking that periodically and bringing those questions forward to our panelists. So. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Before we start asking questions, let me just set the stage for how important the outdoor industry is for Colorado and how global trade is impacting and helping uh, the industry. So prior to COVID, um, which we have to, we probably should say PTC, prior to COVID, it's going to be a new norm to say that, I think. Um, Colorado's economic benefit for the outdoor uh, recreation industry came to about $62 billion annually. So it is a huge industry for our state. Um, we export, Colorado exports, Colorado companies in the outdoor industry space export about $40 million in sporting goods. Um, but the, the exports are down almost 30% this year. Uh, that could be due to a number of reasons, um, which we'll get into today. 17% of our exports go to Canada, number one export market for outdoor industry. Uh, the next is 13% to China. Uh, we're exporting to China, uh, this outdoor industry. And then our next several top trading partners are Japan, UK, Australia, and the Netherlands, but they're all below 8%. So you can see the prominence that Canada has as a as a really prominent export market and a relatively easy market to enter uh, for this industry. So don't ever forget Canada as a viable trading partner. Now, when we talk about imports uh, from this industry, we're importing three times the amount that we're exporting uh, for this industry. About $148 million that we import into Colorado. Um, and so, but, but still our imports are even down 12% and much of that could be because of tariffs and there might be some other issues, supply chain or otherwise that we'll get into today. 69% of our imports come from China for this industry, the broad industry. Um, and the following markets are all under 5% uh, of suppliers for us, Taiwan, Austria, Canada, Thailand, Czech Republic. The Swede Swedish market um, for as a, as a source of products is our 23rd largest import market uh, into Colorado, but still a prominent and important one for us. Let me move from Colorado to US, because we do want to talk about, when we're talking trade policy, it affects all the US, not just Colorado. Um, US exports uh, are about $6.3 billion of this industry. Now, Rich might be able to correct me for specific sporting goods. I'm looking at a broad category here, but that's still down 22% over the year before. Um, imports are about 32.9 billion. So a huge amount of imports in this industry, um, but it's down 15%. So the industry is taking a hit this year uh, when it comes to tariffs, when it comes to supply chain issues and other non-tariff barriers, which we'll talk about today. But here's one thing that we can really celebrate. This industry supports about 7.6 million American jobs. And that's something we all need to hang our hats on because it's the jobs created that are gonna get us through this uh, pandemic and through this economic downturn. Um, and the industry is a very, very strong one for the state of Colorado. Um, here's some of the down, downward, um, or downward news that I need to bring up though, because we need to address this. Um, tariffs. Tariffs, the industry has paid a billion dollars in tariffs this past year over the year before. Tariffs um, do not mean, many people think that um, the Chinese are paying our tariffs. That is so not true. Um, who pays the tariffs is the importer. So it's whoever is importing either components, um, 
equipment or actual finished goods, they're paying the tariff and they most typically will pass those increased costs on to us, the consumer here in the United States. So basically the things that we used to buy are now more expensive. Let me give you an example, hiking boots, tariff of 52% in some cases, um, more than what you would pay otherwise. Um, and you know, the other thing that's concerning us is that we've got some tariffs being threatened, other tariffs realized, companies are having a hard time planning for those changes in costs because that means they have to change their price tags in their, in their equipment, they have to change their strategies of, and budgets around um, moving product around the world. And so the fact that tariffs are on again, off again in one week to the next is causing its own stressors onto the industry. So I wanna dive into that. But needless to say, um, regardless, any increased costs or tax, tariff is a tax, um, will go um, almost 100% to the consumer. And that's something we should actually know as a community. Because I think there are um, policies we should uh, welcome and then there are some policies we should question. So we'll get into that today. I'm not trying to take any sides um, on any administration here. I'm not uh, going to focus on on uh, the personalities of different administrations, um, but instead I want to focus on policy and how it impacts our companies here in Colorado. So with that, I want to welcome again our great panelists and I want to hear from them. Um, Rich, I'd like to start with you. Um, help us put all this content into context for those that are especially not in this industry. Um, tariffs seem to be uniquely high for the outdoor industry. Why is that? What's the administration trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish there? Sure. I mean, a lot of these tariffs really go back to Smoot Hawley and the, the tariffs that were hiked on imports before the, the Great Depression. And you know, one of the arguments we make on Capitol Hill when I'm representing the industry is that these really are unnecessarily high and outdated. And so a lot of these tariffs were put in place decades ago, and they're put in place at a time where certain products were import sensitive, where there is robust domestic production. But a lot of the, our products, um, especially in the high-tech innovative outdoor categories in apparel and footwear came much later. And yet they were still caught up in these categories that were created in the 1930s. One example, is a pair of athletic footwear with a waterproof breathable liner. You take that waterproof breathable liner out and it faces a 20% tariff. You put it back in and it goes up to 37.5%. And that in that in that category, the, the tariff schedule is considered essentially a rubber boot when it's actually just a, a, a athletic footwear. Um, and so we worked on an initiative that passed Congress to sign into law to lower that tariff back to uh, 20%. But that's just one example uh, of many. Um, and so the concern certainly for our companies now is that we're in the midst of still dealing with tariffs put on place as part of the U.S.-China trade war. So you take that 20% um, that uh, tariff on that footwear, you're adding another 7.5% on top of that if it's sourced from China. And of course, we also have to deal with the threat that other punitive tariffs could be placed you know, on additional outdoor products. Um, and so that's sort of the message we try to share with the administration and Congress that outdoor products are already overly taxed, and in some cases, um, unnecessarily high and completely uh, outdated. But as you said, it has a direct impact on the number of jobs that outdoor companies can create all through the supply chain uh, in data processing and design development, retail marketing. Um, I met with a member today who talked about the challenges of hiring somebody in customer service, but couldn't do so because they're facing punitive tariffs. And that you don't always uh, understand, especially on Capitol Hill and with the administration candidly, that those are critical jobs in the supply chain uh, for outdoor companies. And so tariffs have a direct impact on those companies and their ability to grow their business. Yes, absolutely. It just tariffs are making our companies less competitive. That's a fair mm -hmm. statement, right? Yeah, no, very much so. And so, you know, as those additional tariffs, as you said, are taxes on these businesses. And so they have to forego new business opportunities. They have to forego new uh, export markets um, because they're so much focused now on supply chain management. We're trying to find ways to shift those supply chains out to, to a country 
um, and, and find another one, uh, another sourcing partner. Um, and ultimately, I think the administration, particularly with the China 301 tariffs, hasn't achieved their objective. Uh, we had an initial phase one deal that provided limited relief, um, but we're still nowhere near a, a final deal where Ch China would make significant commitments to enforce uh, protections uh, for U.S. intellectual property. Uh, so they haven't achieved their goal, and now the administration is making noises about um, going after Vietnam under the same provision of U.S. trade law. So it is deeply concerning to outdoor companies that are trying to plan their businesses, trying to plan job hires and explore new product development. Um, our members just want to get back to what they do best, as Dino, I'm sure, can share in developing the latest and greatest innovative outdoor gear. And instead, they're spending a lot of time on supply chain management and trying to deal with the, these higher tariffs and doing as, as much as possible to avoid passing them on to the consumer. But in some cases, it's, it's inevitable. Yeah, thank you so much for setting the stage. Dino, let's turn to you. Um, Hester's operating in China, Vietnam, Hungary, maybe other markets. Um, how have the tariffs impacted your operations this past year and what percentage of the tariffs have you had to pass along to consumers? Well, that, <clears throat> Karen, actually it started about two years ago when this all went into play. It started at a 15% increase and then uh, additional lists were released and it went to 25%. And that's in addition to our normal duties of say five to 12%. So, you know, now we're looking at mid 30% tariffs on, on all our goods. Luckily for Hestra, we own four factories. Uh, so we own our own production. So we were able to shift um, about 80% of our production from our China facilities to Vietnam. But just as Rich said, it may be for not because uh, they're on the, the naughty list as well. So um, by doing that, we were able to circumvent the 25% increase to our consumers and reduce that to about 10% at retail. Okay, good. That's a good move. Um, thank you so much. CJ, let me turn to you. How is our sport managing um, the increased tariffs? What strategies are you leveraging? Um, First, thanks for inviting us. We really appreciate this. And these are always so um, informative and um, great to get together and chat through what everyone's doing. So hopefully we can find best practice as we move forward. Um, we actually are so much smaller than Dino and the rest. So I would say a great two perspectives on one, a larger company. And then we are a very small company startup. Um, so for our sport, we honestly have one factory that we've been working with. We've had a relationship with them for about 20 some odd years through multiple different companies. And um, they actually came to us with the concept of de minimis it was using that what was, I think, but prior to 2016, a $200 cap is now an $800 cap for now. Um, and we luckily, our factory has pick and pack ability. So we get our order in, we send it to the factory and they can fulfill our orders from there. It's not my love because we tend to give something additional when we have it and ship it out ourselves. We put personal notes in, we make a connection. And so to get a package this way and get a note this way, it doesn't quite work. So we chose not to um, follow that path but we're still exploring it for future. Um, I would say, you know, we're hoping that it changes, but again, I've also been advised by prior uh, bosses, hope is not a business strategy. So <laughs> we're staying away from that side and trying to put real plans to play, but um, you know, our using one of our best selling products, which is our, our Capri's, um, that's a 28.2% duty that we were on list for, a 15% additional tariff at the end of last year, um, went up to 43.2%. So immediately your strategy of sales that was going to pick up on wholesale now has to be pulled back. And then COVID hits on top of it and all of your events and you know maybe potentially for us, it was about 40% of our sales going to races and expos, triathlons, runs. Um, all of a sudden that's out too. So two of these channels that you were really hoping to make a little more robust aren't happening. At the same time, we are also not the size of um, Hestra and some of the larger players. So we couldn't easily move those charges onto our customer in you know, our third year in production or, or in business um, and have them say, no problem. 
because our $84 Capri would have been about 96. Wow. Um, so we really had to hold, especially because you're looking at your competitors. So if they're not moving, we can't either. So we absorbed it ourselves and that's tough for a startup. Yeah, it's like a triple whammy. Um, it is. So we were happy when they reduced this year to the 7.5%. What was it back in uh, March, April, sometime around there? We adjusted when our products came in and then um, just to see if we could beat it. But of course, everybody was trying to beat it. It's kind of like when COVID hit and everyone ran for toilet paper here, everyone was running to make sure that they could get their goods in either prior to um, or wait and come in after those um, reductions came. So this year it was 7.5%. Um, additional, so it's a little bit better, but yeah, we've still got still got a lot of muck to get through. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, back to you. I know that um, Hestra is considering leveraging uh, a, a newer foreign trade zone in the Jefferson County region as a way to reduce tariffs. Um, uh, can you just walk us through your strategy there and how you think that'll help? Yeah, luckily, um, I like to say I'm a rocket scientist and made this decision to build our company outside of Denver here because of the free trade zone. But we found out um, about six months after moving in that Jefferson County uh, was working with U.S. Customs to designate this part of Arvada, Lakewood, and some parts of Wheat Ridge, I believe, as a free trade zone. And so we immediately jumped on board and wanted to participate in uh, so once they got approved, uh, we began to look in the into the process. So a foreign trade zone or free trade zone, as it's also known as, um, allows us uh, to pay duties on products when they leave our facility, not at the port. So the main benefit to that is cash flow. Um, you know, we're a very seasonal company and we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, penalty tariffs and normal tariffs well ahead of our season before we receive any cash flow. So the way it works is we uh, bring the goods in bond from the port to our facility here. Our facility would have to be inspected by US Customs and designated as secure. And once that happens, then we pay duties when the product leaves our facility. So that's a benefit from a cash flow perspective. The other opportunity is uh, for our Canadian customers um, they have trade agreements with uh, both Europe and Vietnam. So those goods would pass through our warehouse uh, without any duties whatsoever. Um, it's a pretty intensive process to go through and we're just now starting. We had our kickoff call about a week ago and it's gonna take us probably six to eight months to get through the process, but we're hoping to have it in place by next fall. That's terrific. Um, let me just make a note that Denver also is a grant of a foreign trade zone. So um, I think they're woefully underutilized in Colorado. And I do think it's um, many more companies are paying attention to it because of the increased tariffs. Um, it, is a, it is an effective tool um, to, to mitigate some tariffs and also to eliminate some paperwork too. There's, um, I think you'll see there'll, there'll be benefits of, of of paperwork reduction as well. So, um, but it does take a lot of paperwork and a lot of uh, customs compliance issues to get through it. So you have to be patient. Um, I think six months might be on the soon side. It may take you much longer than that. So um, um, if, if anyone else on the call is interested in foreign trade zones and learning more, you can certainly give us a call here at the World Trade Center. We can try to help or at least connect you to the right players. Um, it is a very effective tool used in uh, every state, every state has foreign trade zones. It's just how well they're utilized. I think Colorado is underutilizing them. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, let's move from tariffs because they depress me um, <laughs> to supply chain issues, which is also equally depressing, but um, because of COVID. But let's let's dive into supply chain issues. Rich, um, COVID has caused unprecedented supply chain challenges for this industry, for every industry. Um, can you share some of the most severe challenges from some of your members and what the impact's been on the U.S. manufacturers or jobs for the industry? Sure. I recall the last time, I think I was in Denver in January, the Outdoor Retailer Show, and goodness, yeah, a few months ago before all this went down, it was the first time we had a discussion about 
uh, members sharing with us that factor, their factories in China had started to shut down due to COVID. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty about when they would come back online, a lot of uncertainty about how that would impact their orders. Um, and that's and that's exactly, I think, you know, what concerned us the most is what we saw is that it created more uncertainty for these companies that were already dealing with the challenges of higher punitive tariffs on a lot of their products uh, coming out of China. Uh, so it was just one more uncertainty there, one more um, issue that they had to try and manage um, uh, and, and take time away from trying to grow their business and develop new products. And so I think what you saw was that serious disruptions to the supply chain, serious disruptions to getting um, orders uh, into the country in time. Um, and there, then there's a snowball effect. And so as China uh, came to grips, uh, or as much as possible came to grips with COVID and some of their factories uh, came online, and we saw this, uh, the, uh, obviously COVID extend to other countries, uh, Vietnam, uh, Central American countries. And so where members might have uh, in the past shifted out of China to other countries, they now were being hit. Um, and in addition, a lot of members were trying and looking for opportunity to shift their supply chains, uh, certainly out of China before uh, COVID. And then with travel restrictions, that became nearly impossible. So it was impossible for companies to look at another option, seek a new vendor partner uh, in the Philippines, for example, or elsewhere, um, because they didn't have the opportunity to travel there, be on the ground, uh, and make sure that that partner could uh, to manufacture the products there. Uh, specifications. And I should also add that this also had a direct impact on our domestic manufacturers, our main USA manufacturers. Um, a lot of these are members that manufacture in the US also rely on global supply chains uh, for inputs in their products. And so they were impacted when their vendor partners uh, shut down and they didn't have the opportunity to um, meet the orders uh, that they had hoped to. So, and these are challenges that uh, remain in a lot of instances as we've seen um, and other countries deal with uh, new waves of, of, of COVID, um, so having additional impact uh, on their supply chains. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, CJ, I'd love to turn to you this time. Um, can you share your story of any supply chain disruptions, um, either domestically or internationally, that you've faced? Sure, actually, Rich just reminded me of another one. I thought, oh yeah, <laughs> like there's so <laughs> many. I'm sure we have tons on our list, right? Yep. But, um, Ours, when it initially hit, we were on the front end of it and shipping was already kind of happening as things were shutting down. So we got lucky and we don't have probably as many shipments as some of the larger players may have. But um, we luckily and were um, kind of ahead of it, watching it precariously as it, as it came over. But we ship from China, that's where our factory is. It made it to the US port, no problem. And our only delay honestly was at the US ports. Um, but we were completely informed. They kept us up to date. Honestly, Honestly, the lateness was about a week, which was manageable, certainly. Um, but it's interesting as uh, I'll go back and add since I said, oh, yeah, another idea came up when when the tariffs were hitting and we were looking at what are other options. Um, you know, Rich is right. We couldn't necessarily go and visit, but we have a, a breadth of partners that we already know work really well. So we thought maybe we could shift some items, not all, but some. And when we reached out to a number of them they were suffering themselves because their own facilities were having challenges with COVID for one, shut down by countries, and it varied by country that you were looking at. Um, or it wasn't just their own people that, you know, it was shut down, but transportation. Many of them were relying on um, local domestic transportation to get them from city to factory, and they were all shut down. So even though they could come to work, they couldn't get there. So yeah, it's um, yeah worldwide pandemic. Because yeah, of the pandemic. Absolutely. Dido, did you have any strategies that you'd like to share to mitigate your supply chain issues? Yeah, as um, I mentioned earlier, uh, 2017, we built a brand new uh, factory in Vietnam. And uh, as luck would have it, because we didn't see this COVID coming, nobody did, obviously. But um, the, the biggest challenge for us was we had to shift all of our production from you know, two of our best factories, uh, one in Guangzhou and one in Shanghai, uh, to Vietnam to mitigate uh, the penalty tariffs. And we had our production plan all in place and everything was locked and loaded. And then we had to stop and, and reinvent the wheel, if you will. Um, we're lucky that we had that facility. Um, last winter, we doubled the size of that facility. We hired another 125 workers. Mm -hmm. um, so the future for us um, is shifting from China to Vietnam, and I think that's the same for a lot of uh, manufacturers who are manufacturing in Asia. 
So, you know, we're thankful to have had that facility. Um, and then on top of it, you know, just again, logistically, you know, we had to reprice label 250,000 pairs of gloves and <laughs> here in Hesper and, and outside of Denver. And that posed some problems, you know, and challenges uh, getting the labor to do that and being able to, you know, ship all our goods in 60 days, uh, like we do every year uh, before the winter ski season. Wow, well, that's due to the tariffs? Yeah, uh, you know, and we tried to mitigate, obviously, as much of the increase and pass along the least amount possible, but we couldn't take it internally. You know, we, we absorbed the first 15% increase internally, and it puts a lot of stress on a company. Uh, when it went to 25%, we said, you know, we can't do this. We're going to have to pass it along. The good news is for HESFRA, it really hasn't impacted our sell through. And, you know, people are still, you know, uh, wearing HESFRA, buying HESFRA. Um, you know, I'm hopeful this goes away uh, in, you know, the not too distant future. And, and then we can readjust our pricing accordingly. Yeah, great. Okay. You know, every challenge like COVID um, or economic recessions um, that followed brings on some opportunities. And we've got to turn the mood to a positive for this, uh, the remaining time of this panel. Um, there are some opportunities because of COVID. Uh, pivot, companies are pivoting like I've never seen before. Technology is filling the void, um, keeping us connected. Um, Rich, I'd love to um, hear what sort of recent challenges e-commerce um, brings for this industry and some of the new de minimis values um, of, and, and other, other, you know, tariffs that are changing because of e-commerce platforms. E-commerce is a, is a shining light now because of COVID. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about how that's changed uh, for the industry for the better. Sure. I mean, I think um, you're right. There, we've seen one of the bright sides of all of this is that there's a surge in interest in, in outdoor recreation. Um, so more Americans are getting outdoors. Some Americans are getting outdoors and discovering outdoor recreation for the first time. And so in some cases, our members are trying to keep up um, with those new enthusiasts and have gear uh, ready for them in their stores. But one way that members have survived all this, or at least helped bridge the gap, is through e-commerce and the ability to uh, supply customers through their e-commerce platforms. Um, and CJ mentioned to at, at the beginning of the presentation, there is an opportunity through a uh, so-called de minimis rule, where if a, direct, a shipment direct to consumer on an e-commerce platform, less than $800 um, doesn't have to pay a duty. And so it's an opportunity for outdoor companies to avoid a cost on those products. Tying that to uh, U.S. foreign trade zones that Dino mentioned, you know, one of the initiatives that, that we're working on is that we want to give that same opportunity to U.S. foreign trade zones. And despite the name, that, that those trade zones are, as we discussed, uh, within the customs territory of the United or they're in the United States, but considered outside the customs territory. Uh, so it is a bit of a misnomer, but we're working on an initiative that would allow um, outdoor companies to fulfill e-commerce orders, de minimis e-commerce orders, uh, direct to consumer from US foreign trade zone and avoid paying the tariff. And the thrust of that initiative is that there's incentive right now for outdoor companies to shift uh, those orders to Canada uh, to Mexico or elsewhere because they could do so duty free. We want to give those US foreign trade zones the same opportunity and help preserve uh, some jobs there. So it is an exciting uh, initiative and one we'll work on in the next uh, Congress for sure. One thing to, to be aware of um, that I might add, perhaps on the negative side, is e commerce orders and de minimis shipments have been a way to avoid the China uh, punitive tariffs. And this has certainly caught. Uh, the administration's attention they're looking to close that loophole so not only would you have to pay the normal tariff rate but then you'd have to pay uh, the punitive tariff uh, on top of that uh, so something to, to to keep an eye on and we're trying to you know alert our members um, when that does go through great news um, let us know how we can support you on that one uh, we'd love to help you um, cj uh, dino you both sell products via e-commerce how is your e-commerce platform working for you um, now during COVID? I guess I'll, I'll start first, Dino. Um, 
We saw a little bit of a blip right at the beginning, I think, and a little bit of just consumer panic of what's happening and how does this shake up my world. Um, and so I would say right around March and early April, we saw a slight decline and then it started to peak back up and our numbers have been better than they were in prior years. Now we're not, um, you know, we're not in the six digit range here, but um, of uh, percentages of growth just yet. But at the same time, we took that as a positive for sure. At the same time, when you're asking, you know, what are the positive sides? Um, one, you just said, hey, Rich, let us know how we can help. And I'm totally down with that, Karen. So whatever Rich <laughs> tells us we should do, let us know because we wanna support those same efforts as well. Um, they help all of us overall. But I think one of the things that we've noticed, you know, we try to look at the silver lining, um, that e-commerce side, though it's increasing our sales overall and has certainly been um, a nice beacon of light um, when all the others are a little shaded, um, has been that it's increasing our ability to connect with our community. And the community is all going through this pandemic at the same time, though their situations may be different, um, the one thing that we can do is get out. Um, and so that's kind of your closest thing to normal is potentially without a mask. If you're not close to other people, you're on a ride, you're on a run, you're on a hike. And so not only have people been coming to us, but they are maybe getting back into it after they've been away from it. And so you've got a little camaraderie going on when you need more community and you've lost the physical touch. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Dina, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think a, a big surprise for us, not a lot of people know this, but uh, not only do we do sport gloves, we also have a dress division and then a work garden glove division. And uh, to our surprise, uh, this past spring with uh, everybody wanting to be home and, and you know, being uh, locked up and uh, looking for something to do, a hobby, uh, our garden glove business uh, went up and increased about 50 percent so that was a nice uptick um yeah. very uh you know positive to see um it's a little soon for us to see what this winter is going to bring um but uh, year over year we're up about 18 percent uh, on our sport glove division and dress glove division and hopefully you know that that trend will increase as we get closer to holiday that's amazing that's yeah. great news um I want to turn soon to the uh, audience questions that we're getting in, but before I do, let me just ask you all, whoever would like to chime in, um, with one of the biggest industries hit are the, is the aviation industry and tourism and, and trade show and conventions and any type of gathering. Um, and with canceled trade shows, even one we know and love here in Colorado, moving to virtual, um, which makes me so sad. Um, there's a new norm of Zoom connection. We're doing it today, but I'm sure you're doing it to find new distributors, new sales, new opportunities. Um, how have you pivoted or how has it been to pivot to that digital connection? Is it as meaningful? Can you still conduct business? Um, or are you, are you really struggling because of the lack of face-to-face? -face? Anybody want to chime in on that? Yeah, you know, I'll go first. You know, obviously, it's the big challenge for us is it's a major shift in our whole sales process. You know, we knew it was coming, but with the announcement of the cancellation of the outdoor retailer show, you know, that was our big annual show. That's when we all got together, uh, you know, and we're able to meet with all of our customers. So we've had to do this major shift, rapid shift to all digital, and we're managing that through our B2B portal. Um, outdoor retailer is going to have a digital variation of their show that we'll participate in. And so, you know, it's a, it's a major shift and it's a little too soon for me to comment because we have our international sales meeting digitally uh, next Monday morning at 6 a.m. from Sweden. <laughs> so once we get through that process, then we go into our sales cycle and then our sales cycle is November through end of January into February. So it's going to be interesting, but our sales team is preparing all of our reps are getting ready for this digital assault. I'm a little concerned because I think people are going to get Zoom and, and Teams burnout. Um, I know it's it's for all of us, you know, it's this is the new way of life. But uh, when you're a buyer looking at hundreds of lines, you know, how many lines are you going to be able to go through and in what period of time? So, you know, it's a new adventure and it's definitely a game changer. I, I'm hopeful that we get back to the physical shows at some point uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, great. Anybody else have anything to add or should I move to audience questions? 
I would just add from the product build side and the relationship side, the shows are a nice um, a way and timing to touch, feel, love new fabrics, um, you know, meet your vendors again. And the face-to-face, -face, I think, can never be fully supported by Zoom, though it certainly is a nice bridge until we can get back to the face-to-face. -face. Um, so lack of flying, lack of travel is kind of replaced by, hey, if I can't feel it on Zoom and I can't really see the drape by something that you're, you're showing me, um, we're seeing more shipping going back and forth, which is why everybody's seeing FedEx and UPS and um, Amazon all the time. Um, so just the new way, the new path. Great, great. Let me move to some questions if I can. Um, and I'll try to address these to individuals that I think could ask them, answer them, but then feel free to punt if you'd rather one of the other panelists take it. Um, this one's for Rich. Uh, who namely is the agency in the US government that decides tariffs in particular, how and when to update the industrial or product categories? Um, do these match international industrial product categories? Yeah, I mean, Congress would set the, the tariff schedule, but we do have international agreements where we try to align um, those tariff rates uh, across certain product categories. Um, we seek to adjust and change uh, those tariffs through individual pieces of legislation. So for example, we work on so-called miscellaneous tariff bills, which reduce or eliminate tariffs on a particular product for a three-year period. Um, we advocate and participate in the negotiation of free trade agreements. They revised NAFTA agreement, USMCA went through this year and Karen, you spoke about how important the Canadian market is for US manufacturers, that that agreement preserved that reciprocal duty-free market access um, for outdoor products. <laughs> I had a big sigh of relief. Um, and then there are trade preference programs like the generalized system of preferences for uh, trade preference program for developing countries, allow products to be, uh, certain products to be imported duty-free if they come from an eligible GSP uh, country, um, but it is extremely challenging um, to change uh, those tariff rates in a lot of instances. It's 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 a hard slog to get uh, tariff legislation through. Um, but what, what I think what we bring to the table as an industry is that we work with importers and domestic manufacturers alike, um, and so we are, we're able to bring that to the table um, and achieve some key wins for our industry. One that I mentioned at the beginning, lowering the tariff on a particular athletic footwear product from 37.5 to 20%. So it's challenging, it takes a lot of work. Um, a robust, uh, comprehensive reform of the US tariff schedule, I think we'd be welcome to participate in that process, but candidly, um, that's not likely happening uh, anytime soon. We're barely able to keep the government open sometimes. Yeah, agreed. Um, I'm gonna address this next one to Dino. Dino, why did you choose Colorado? as your location um, over maybe Oregon or Washington. We've got an Argentine on the call wanting to move to the U.S. and wanting to know why Colorado. Because I'm a Colorado native and proud of it. There you go. <laughs> no, really. Um, when uh, the Magnuson family, the owners of Hestra, uh, started looking around and, and wanting to establish a, a U.S. headquarters, um, they're all avid skiers and, you know, Obviously, Utah, Colorado um, is the pinnacle of that. And, and the Rockies is, you know, our biggest territory. Uh, we have the most customer count in, in between Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Colorado. So it made really good sense. Plus, you know, we're, we're close to an international airport, um, which helps with uh, facilitating of the import of goods and such. And as I said, I'm a Colorado boy, so I don't, I don't want to move. <laughs> Plus, the Outdoor Industry Association is here and a uh, great place to locate, to be close yeah. to the source. Um, There's a lot of great outdoor companies in the front range here. Absolutely. Um, CJ, let me see if you can do this one. It's about textile rule of origin. If uh, you feel comfortable, great. If not, feel free to punt to Rich. I'll give all the hard questions to Rich. Um, this company is getting hit with tariffs with our Bangladesh factories based on the textiles originating in China. Um, any thoughts about that? Yes, it's it's real. It's true. Like clearly, they're experiencing it. I would say Rich may have an answer as to whether there's a roundabout there, but I'm not aware of one at this point. Okay. Yeah, it really depends on the particular type of product. Each product has a different rule of origin, but a lot of instances, it's a so-called yarn forward rule. So if the yarn originates uh, in a particular country, but the product and the fabric and the final product is uh, manufactured elsewhere, it's still 
uh, the rule of origin is still that country where uh, the yarn was actually um, uh, produced. And so you have to be uh, mindful of that. Okay. So somebody claiming that COVID um, only closed the, the plants in China for two to three months. Do you think it's back up 100% in China? Um, or do you think we still have some supply chain closures uh, for producers there? Um, you know, I can comment quickly and then Rich, um, for us at our factories, we actually, it COVID kind of followed uh, the Chinese New Year. Um, so our factories were closed for maybe a month or two and then back up and operational. I know some other manufacturers have had other challenges. Um, we've had challenges with our dress factories that we deal with um, out of the Philippines because the whole country shut down for three months. So we're freighting in product now and you know it's later than we would like, but um, we haven't seen a major shutdown uh, effect uh, from our China factories. We're in the I'll same line as Dino, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I would just quickly add, I think we hear fewer stories of disruptions from China, but the challenge is that they've now extended to other countries. And so I hear more from Central America, certainly than I do China. Um, but so they've moved on to, you know, a different part of the world. Rich, that's funny because that's exactly the factory I was mentioning earlier is El Salvador. Yep. They were yep. the ones who were having the transportation issues. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So obviously the administration's uh, goal is to bring manufacturing back to the U.S., um, I think that's why the tariffs were put in place. It's also to punish China, um, but it's funny because we're paying the tariffs. Um, just that's a side note. Uh, but how many companies or do you know of companies that have brought production back to the U.S. Um, because of the tariffs? And if so, could you share any of those stories? Do you know, do you know of any? Um, I yeah, top of mind, I think outdoor research actually set up a facility up in Oregon. And the primary focus of that is for military and uh, you know law enforcement, things like that. They wanted to start producing those uh, goods in the US, I believe, for GSA purposes. Um, you know, unfortunately, the reality of it is the footwear industry, the glove making industry left the US a long time ago. Um, you know, cost of labor, uh, for sewers was just, you know, increasing at a rate that it's increasing like in China right now. So that forced these jobs out of the U.S. market. Um, do I ever foresee them manufacturing gloves in the U.S.? It, it's quite doubtful. Um, my wife has a handbag company and they're using cottage sewers to manufacture her handbags, which is really cool. Um, so, but when it comes to gloves, you know, our, our one of our best models takes a, an hour and a half to produce each pair. And it's very technical when you're sewing with leather and fingers and foreshits and all that. So I, I don't see it coming back. You know, there's a town in New York called Gloversville, New York, and I've visited tanneries there and it's, it's really sad. You know, you could see what it once was maybe in the forties or fifties, but you know, I don't see those jobs coming back uh, to the U S market. I'm gonna make, make this the last question and then we'll give you guys time to wrap, do some final wrap up remark. But um, the last question is put your crystal ball on. How do you see it changing um, if the Trump administration wins versus the Biden administration wins? Um, and let me just put in a little plug on November 2nd, we're hosting, the World Trade Center is hosting a um, a discussion, a dialogue on just that. So if you want more, uh, sign up for that event and uh, it's on our calendar. So tell me, does anybody want to tackle that? What, where do you think trade's heading under different administrations going forward? This is totally a rich conversation. <laughs> totally a rich <laughs> He's got the closest, closest ball here, so go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I think if it's a Trump two administration, we'll continue to see the use of tariffs to, see, to achieve policy objectives. I'm very concerned about um, the relationship with China in a Trump two administration, the potential for that so-called list 4B, the, the, the final round of punitive tariffs that was suspended, it was suspended, it wasn't canceled. Um, I think, and you'll see it elsewhere, perhaps with Vietnam, uh, they review the eligibility of GSP countries. With the Biden administration, I think you're likely to see a more of a multilateral approach, um, but a lot of his focus is on, gonna be on domestic issues, I think, in the first year. And so with China, for example, while I don't think we'll see an increase in tariffs, he's still gonna need something from the Chinese 
uh, to be able to remove those tariffs. So perhaps there could be a goodwill gesture, um, but it, it, there would still be considerable time, I think, before uh, those tariffs uh, would come off. Great, succinct answer, thank you. Um, okay, we're gonna move to just final comments. We're talking 30 seconds or less. CJ, I'm gonna start with you and just say, what, what else would you like to share that maybe I should have asked or maybe just have other thoughts on your mind? Uh, honestly, I don't think there's anything else to share. So many of us are, are, are hitting the same challenges. Um, it's just how you get through it. So we had that discussion earlier this week. Um, but um, one of the things I thought of is an old president of mine who I really highly respect, who is a um, ex-pro national champ cyclist, used to say, attack when it's hard. So don't fall back, don't wait. Business will continue. It may look different from what we know, but um, you know, be aggressive. That's great. I love that. Tack while it's hard. Okay. Dino, um, up to you now. Final yeah, up. you know, I think as Rich said earlier, based on the increased numbers of participation, outdoor participation that we've seen this past summer, I mean, Breckenridge had one of their uh, best summer, spring summers ever. Um, you know, it, the mountains were just alive. And I'm hopeful that for our industry that everybody stays outside this winter. Um, I have the gloves to keep your hands warm. So <laughs> I love that. My, my selfish little plug, selfless nice plug. plug. But yeah, I hope everybody stays out and, and stay safe and mask up and uh, hopefully we get through this sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's true. Rich, final words. Yeah, I would guess I would just urge everyone to participate in uh, the public policy process. And we're here to help you do that. Your voice should be heard um, by your elected representatives. As we discussed today, it has a direct impact on your businesses. And we're, help, we're here to help you connect your voice to your elected representatives so they understand the impact that these issues have on your business. Great. Thank you all so much for being part of this panel and sharing your stories. It's not easy to talk about this um, publicly because it, it hits our bottom lines and top lines. So um, I really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing challenges because that's how other companies learn um, too, is to learn from others, strategies, tactics, um, mistakes sometimes. So um, uh, I just, I thank you for, for sharing uh, with us today. Um, Marie, I'll turn it back over to you to close us out. Oh yeah, I can just say and thank you, Karen, as well, and thank you all for sharing all this. And and to piggyback a little bit what CJ said as well was, when we don't have the retail shows or the big, then you don't meet each other, you miss out on that kind of communication that you have. Like you learn more about what's going on in the industry. We do more. It takes more of an effort to get that kind of information or that those kind of connections like this. So, but it also gives opportunities. We all kind of tired of Zoom in one way, but it also gives opportunity to do things on a different level. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thank you all participants and everyone who has thrown in so many great questions here. And uh, yeah, and you panelists and outdoor industry, let's, you know, let's just go out there and uh, enjoy. And roam. And roam as free as we can. Yes. <laughs> and uh, also for information, make sure uh, if you don't want to know anything more, about uh, Swedish American Chambers of Commerce, please feel, feel free to contact me, check out our website. Um, I think the slide was just changing there, but, and also the same thing with World Trade Center or the Outdoor um, Industry Association and anyone. And please connect. And if you have other good ideas of what would be helpful in the business industry, let Karen and myself know. Perfect. Thank you all very much. Um, appreciate your engagement. All right, we'll see you at our next event, hopefully on November 2nd. We welcome you there. Take care. Thanks, Karen.